morning. Someone told me during the break that uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira is another uh, very interesting way to uh, define a short sale. <laughs> well, whatever. I, I thought it was funny, but... Uh, Hey, we've been tracking uh, this month as we as we talk about stewardship that there are really three components: the the personality or the personhood of, of the steward is is important because they are people with a God-sized dream. They're doing things that seem impossible. They're taking on tasks that, for them, they couldn't accomplish without the help of God. We've also found out that there's a principle that's involved, and it's very well known, but it's not often followed. And the principle is this. It's better to give than receive. Now, we say that. We tell our kids that. We, but, but to live that, to really understand that it, it, is, it is about the outflow of abundance, because we aren't the source, because we trust and know that God is the source. There's something powerful. And then last week and this week, we've been talking about the practice that if you have that principle and you own that dream, it's going to come out in, in the way that you use your time, your spiritual gifts, what I call your talent. It's going to come out in, in, in the way that you use your treasure, the, the, the physical manifestation of all the things you have and because we know that God has given us all this. And our testimony, the story, the greatest story ever told, is the story that you get to tell about how Jesus saved you with another person. And boy, we're all blocked up with that, aren't we? In this day and age, I don't want to offend anyone. I, you know, I'll tell your story. And, and so, with that in, in mind, I, I want us to look at bold faith and action part two. I want to look at the practice in part two. And I just want to ask this very simple question, but it's profound. How fruitful are your intentions? How fruitful are the things that you intend to do? I mean, you could, you could rate that however you want to rate that. You can work with that however you want to work with that. But the... Uh, but how well does that work for you? You know? You see, for some of us, and maybe for most of us, at best our intentions are wishful, and at worst our intentions are weakness. Because they allow us to say in our minds we want to do something, and then if we never end up doing it, it's because our minds also say there was some kind of built-in excuse as to why we never did that. And there we are, lost in intention. Uh, not so profound, but awfully true. In, in the game of baseball, the, uh, the running coach on first base has primary wisdom to anyone who would run the bases. And that is simply this. You can't steal second base and keep a foot on first base. Right? You just don't stretch that far. You gotta go. And, and, and practice is about going where God leads you. Practice isn't about holding off and, and trying to think of some way to get all of the eggs in the basket or everything ready the way we want it ready. When God says go, we have the privilege and the honor to go, even if the, we're not quite ready yet. It is on the ascendant in our hearts. But God is moving our minds and our bodies forward. So two examples, uh, one choice, right? I have never done a sermon on the Ananias and Sapphira story, and someone said, boy, I sure want to be like Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> never heard of that. Never heard of that. So I think I, I, I think I just can say from the out shot that there's two examples and one choice. And here's the deal. We never intend to be like that either. But sometimes we find ourselves. Wow. 
So uh, the first example is the example of Barnabas. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a piece of property that he owned, brought the money to the apostles, and laid it at their feet. Boom. He's, he's doing a couple things. The son of encouragement is also an encourager. But the first thing he is, he's a follower. He followed and he obeyed. Okay? Remember how our story ended last week. That many people in the church just started funding the church by selling off stuff and saying, Okay, God, you take this. We'll see what happens. And amazing things started to happen. But there's a larger picture to Barnabas' story. And I just want to unfold it for you quickly. Not only did he sell that property and, and just give it all away, which, by the way, isn't normative to the, to, to the rest of the Bible. I want you to know that. And, and you're going you're gonna to see some interesting things uh, uh, for yourself today in that. But he became a person who, as I said earlier, followed and obeyed, and he was the encourager of Paul. Remember Paul, uh, who was Saul of Tarsus? He was an angry man. He hated the church. He made sure that on his watch, Christians were killed, and they were sent to prison. So you can imagine the apostles' nervousness when Paul shows up in Jerusalem and says, Oh, that's my past. I'm on your side now. Those apostles sitting there in the upper room, nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. This guy's going to eat us alive. This guy's, this guy's a crazy man. And then a man who is known by his life takes Saul in and introduces him to the apostles and they go, oh, not so bad. You see, without Barnabas, there would never have been a Paul. And there's more to the story because that was his encouragement in, in Jerusalem. In Antioch, the, the apostles sent Barnabas down to Antioch to a growing fledgling church. And when he got there and realized he needed more manpower, he went and found Paul again and introduced him to the Antioch church. So without Barnabas, the church would have never known Paul. And without Barnabas, the world would have never known the gospel that Paul reached, the whole Mediterranean. And, if, and, and it goes on from there because Paul ends up writing a, a, a good uh, two quarters two-thirds of, of the whole New Testament. But you see, the stories in the Bible tell you what's really going on. Paul and Barnabas had a falling out in chapter 15 of Acts. They didn't get along because they had taken Mark on a missions trip for a summer of, of traveling uh, in the Mediterranean and leading churches, and he went home early because he didn't like it. And Paul says, I ain't taking no one that quits on me halfway through. And Barnabas says, hey, hey, Paul, you, you're going to judge Mark by his past? Like the apostles judged you for your past? And, and Paul, it just went right over his head. They split. Barnabas took Mark. And, 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 and Paul uh, took Silas. And they went on their mission trip. But what happened is, Barnabas advocated for Mark. And Mark writes the first gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and all of the gospels used Mark as a template. If someone hadn't stood up for him, we wouldn't have the gospel of Mark and sequentially the other three gospels. Isn't that amazing? This guy gets around. Finally, this, this passage uh, from 2 Timothy 4, because Barnabas was also a reconciler. He reconciled these brothers. Here's what Paul says in one of his last books written at the end of his life. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Get John Mark and bring him with you. He is helpful to me and our ministry. Who was involved in that reconciliation? Again, it was Barnabas who opened the door. You see, Barnabas fulfills a rich spiritual destiny, but he's the silent partner. 
In fact, in Acts, it starts off saying Barnabas and Paul, and after a while, they start saying Paul and Barnabas, and pretty soon they just say Paul. Barnabas is shrinking. His ego is shrinking, but his power in the church is expanding. This is a message to us. This is, this is a way that we can live our lives. We don't have to calculate and fend for ourselves. We can just give ourselves away. You see, Barnabas was the kind of guy who didn't seek opportunity. He sought God, and opportunity sought Barnabas. We don't have to go for what we're after as Christians. We just have to go to God. And everything that God wants us to be after will come to us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto us. Well, the, the second example, uh, not so bright, like I said, the, the, the new definition of a short sale. Check, check this out. Three things happen to Ananias and Sapphira. The first is that they calculated. Check this out. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. He kept part of the money back for himself. What's going on? You see, they're calculating on what they think is expected of them, and they're trying to put together a plan. They're, they're way out in front of God now, okay? They're not trusting God. They're saying, we're, we're just going to, we're going to scope the full range of how this is going to work. We'll calc it out and see if it works, and we'll go from there. So they schemed against themselves, because that's who they had to lie to first. Uh, they schemed against the church, because that's who they end up lying to in the presence. And, and, and then they, they, they schemed against God. And, and by the way, this, I, this is classic, you know. They're scheming against God, check this out, as if God can't hear them. Like us. Right? Like, you know, God's not going to see me do this. God's not going to see me read this. God's not going to know that I think like this. So it's all, you know, we're going to get that all justified at the end here. Hang on. You know, I don't think anyone's going to drop dead today. Just stay with me. So there they are, scheming against God. They Number two, they're misrepresenting. So here, just check out this verse, the last part of verse two. But brought the rest of it and put it at the apostles' feet. So what did they do? They took a whole amount of money. They cut off a piece for themselves, stuck it over here. And they said, here's all of the money. All right? Here it is. So I, you know, I got to think about this. And the only way I can think about it is to put it in real terms. You know, just put it out there, put it on my desk, look at it. So here's, here's my factoring from, from last week. Let's say that, uh, you know, uh, Ananias and Sapphira had, had a property worth $400,000. And they had decided to come to the apostles and say, we want to tithe on the sale of this property $40,000. What would, that is 10%, right? Someone with that. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, got through that. Uh, th so they did that. What would the apostles have said? Thank you. Cool. Yeah, cool. That, that works. Works for us. So say they came in and they said, we sold a $400,000 property and we want to give a gift to the church of $4,000. What would Peter have said? Fine. Thank you very much. But you see, the problem is they wanted to misrepresent. They wanted to look like Barnabas. But they wanted to be Ananias and Sapphira to the core. You see, they didn't have the character or the maturity to just be honest and say, this is all we can do. 
or be bold, and we can't do this, but we're going to. So they became posers and fakes. But they wanted to wear the Christian t-shirt. They, they, they wanted to drive 55 miles an hour in a 45 zone down a Highway 26 with one of those good sand crosses in the back of the car. <laughs> or beat someone across the parking lot for, that, for the one of three spaces in front of Starbucks. You see? These guys aren't that much different than us. That's why I'm sure no one's going to drop dead today, or you would have died already. <laughs> I don't know about the empty seats today and some of the people. We're just hoping they have the flu, right? Okay. I think they do. The last thing, and we've already kind of touched on it, but they become liars. Because, again, Jeff's got to kind of take the story out. So what if... What if Sapphira comes to church three hours later and Peter says, Sister Sapphira, is this the amount that you sold the property for? And she stands there and says, Have you seen my husband lately? Or, or then she says something like this. She goes, You know my husband. You know how he kind of exaggerates? I think he kind of reversed the exaggerated. And you know, I was kind of with him, but I'm standing here right now, and I don't, I think I'm, I, I, I think we made a mistake. What do you think would happen? Mm -hmm. No. Sapphira, is this what you sold the property for? Yeah, who's asking? <laughs> it's a, see, it's a trick. It's a codependent trick. If you come up all fiery when someone's trying to speak truth to your power, you can maybe get them to back off. But you're still a poser. You're still a fake. You're still not linked to Christ. And that's all Peter wanted. To give her a chance. And boom! She fell like a big tree in the forest. She's gone. Two things I need to say about that to a totally quiet room. <laughs> if you're looking for an excuse, you'll always find one. That's the problem with intentions. If you're looking for an excuse, you'll, if you're looking for a shortcut, if you can look like you're all that in a bag of chips and feel like that, you will take that over becoming that. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, if you can, if you can take a, a shortcut or, or, or something that makes you look like what you're not so sure. I mean, you get that, you know, Miss America or Charles Atlas body by taking a pill. There's a big line down there at CVS this afternoon. Because no one wants to go to the gym and do that work to become that healthy or otherwise. So if you're looking for an excuse... You'll always find one. Ananias and Sapphira found the, the easiest next excuse. But if you're looking for an opportunity, you'll always find one. Because that's what Barnabas did. He, he found the opportunity. Barnabas was a stewardship person with a God-sized dream. He understood the stewardship principle. It, was, it made him happy to give more than receive. He gives and gives. I mean, you, you could talk about the Acts of the Apostles, or you could talk and write a book called The Acts of Barnabas and see how the church was, was stitched together by one quiet, solitary encourager that was at the crossroads of the church about five or six times. And we've inherited all of his goodness. All of his encouragement comes to us. Every time you read your New Testament. Wow. What a guy. And practice? Barnabas had no problem laying down his time, talent, treasure, and testimony at the Apostles' feet. About a hundred years ago from right now, a man named Booker T. Washington was perhaps the most famous African-American on the planet, bar none. 
He had an opportunity to have tea uh, with, uh, with the Queen of England. And he was the first African American invited to eat at the White House with Teddy Roosevelt. Rough Rider Teddy, you know. And this is what he said about Booker T. Washington. To a very extraordinary degree, he combines humility with dignity. And he wasn't done. And, uh, and, and by the way, Teddy Roosevelt didn't mince words, right? As much as any other man, said Teddy Roosevelt, President of the United States, any man I've ever met, he lived up to the Micah verse, which says, What more doth the Lord require of thee than to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God? Amen. That's high praise. On March 12th, 1911, Booker T. Washington was in Des Moines, Iowa. He delivered several sermons and speeches all on one day. He spoke to standing room crowds only in St. Paul's Episcopal Church, the, uh, the, the, the Plymouth Brethren Church, the uh, Foster uh, Opera House, and gatherings at four different African American churches all in one day. And he was the talk of the town. Everyone was going, this guy's amazing. Later that evening, much later, after all that, he was in the lobby of the hotel that he was staying in when a woman mistook him for hotel staff. She asked him for a glass of water. And instead of correcting her and identifying who he was, he went and got her a glass of water, and upon giving her the glass of water, he said these simple words. Is there anything else I can get for you? <laughs> and went on his way. I am convinced today that the steward secret virtue is humility. And that most of what keeps us back from doing what you've heard me say for 20 plus years, or if this is your first time you've heard me say for the last four weeks, is some kind of pride that doesn't allow us to just really believe that God is God. We've got all these circumstances and situations, fixed incomes, you know, moms in the hospital, whatever it is that tells us to God's face that we can't instead of we can. So it should come as no surprise to us that humility is the first chapter of every success story in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about what success in the Bible is in just a minute. Mother Teresa was asked one time, gosh, you're so amazingly humble, and she just stood there. You know, she's shorter than everyone in the universe, so she just stood there like this. Didn't say anything like, well, thank you for noticing. <laughs> you all right? And then they gave her a question she could respond to. They said, how, how did you get there? And she looked up and said, accept humiliation. You see, what is it in, in, in our day and age that has divided the words, I want to be humble, but I don't want to be humiliated? <sighs> That's how it works. That's the, that's the whole Christian criteria coming to a grinding halt right at that crossroad. Pride is the first chapter of the book of failure. The temptation to think I could do it on my own and no, one tell, no one's going to tell me what to do. No one's going to ask me whether I'm truthful. I'm just going to get there myself. You see... That turns into something that's very hard to work with. You see, the humble steward is not concerned with their reputation. When we operate by faith, we're not risking our reputation. We're risking God's. We're thinking God doesn't know what God's talking about. And when we doubt, we're not doubting ourselves. We're doubting God because we're the call. We're his we're his prized lambs. 
We're his servants. We're his people. Two pathways to humility. The first is humble yourself before God. This is the path that Barnabas chose. And the second is let God humble you. This is the path that Ananias and Sapphira chose. You know, it's been suggested by some folks that uh, if, if, God hadn't, if God hadn't killed Ananias and Sapphira right in church while they were still inside the doors, They'd have lived their lives to wreck and ruin and know nothing about God when they finally came to their own peaceful death someplace. If God needs to break our hearts or to allow suffering to take place in our lives, to get us to the place where we say, Oh my God, I need you. I can't do this then I'm here to tell you God's in that business and he's gratefully in that business. Hey, grab, grab that insert in your Bible real quick. Just a couple seconds here. It's all you need. Uh, you got one of two choices. You can intend to do this or you can do it. It's a meditation. It's, it's four Bible verses on four topics. Time, testimony, talent, and treasure. You're going to take some time with this and, and say, Hey God, if, if I come up with some stuff that's so counterintuitive and don't, I, I'm, so, I'm so scared to do it and you have to, as God, say, Okay, I'll do it in you. Would you fill it out? Would you take some time? Would you, would you put it in your Bible? Hey, you know what? We, we don't ever do a pledge card at Good Sam. You know why? Because we want you to take this and put it at the top of your bill stack every month. And just review, how am I doing? Better yet, how's God doing in me? What's God doing? Take some time with this. It could change everything for your life. Um, so... Whether we intend to do it or we do it, it, it is, is there. God wants you to be successful. Let me talk a little bit about success. God wants you to fulfill your spiritual destiny. What is success? Success is spelled stewardship. And stewardship is spelled obedience. It's just that simple. Do what you know God has asked you to do and watch what happens in your life and family. Watch what happens. In, in your heart. God, I can guarantee you this, God doesn't always call us to win. He calls us to try. You and I have both learned already that we can succeed at the wrong thing and fail at life. Or, we can fail at the right thing and succeed in life. Right? Jesus was considered a failure. Mark was considered a failure. And so was Barnabas by Paul. And Peter thought Paul was a failure. And Paul thought Peter was a failure at one time. That, I mean, they all just kind of had that out for each other. And they had to work it all out. And let God do something about that. What I'm trying to say this morning is don't give up before you give it a try. Because the God that we worship, His truth is unstoppable, His grace is unconquerable, but we must step up and step in so God can show up in your life and show off in the world around you. And, and those are the gateways to the powerful things that God wants to do in our lives. Lord Jesus, I pray this morning <coughs> That as we come to the end of, uh, of this time and we, we think about what it is that, uh, that you have for us, that you would remind us that our lives are as simple as getting our foot off of first base and chugging it down the line to second base. Maybe we'll get tagged out. Maybe we'll slide in. But it's the trying. You are calling us to something yet seen by us. 
And it's in that that you want to create something new and powerful and dynamic. Because it is only in those things that we understand that we can't and you can, and so we're going to let you work.